Summary of The Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. Book 1. Boethius is under arrest for treason and confined to his chamber, ruminating on his miserable situation. He has tried to take refuge in poetry as various poetic muses have appeared in his room to inspire him. Suddenly, another apparition appears, a female figure Boethius doesn't recognize. She wears a long gown. In her left hand she has books, in her right, a scepter. This new apparition rebukes the muses for their ineffectiveness and they flee. The apparition then chastises Boethius for not recognizing her and for wallowing in self-pity. She says he is confused about his situation and will feel better only when he recognizes his true identity. The apparition wipes Boethius' eyes with her robe and he realizes she is the goddess philosophy. Boethius is relieved and his melancholy lifts for a moment. He asks her why she has appeared, thinking that maybe she is going to go on trial with him. She says she has come to support him, just as she supported other condemned philosophers, such as Socrates and Seneca. The philosopher shouldn't worry about physical harm, she says. He should be above it. Boethius can't accept this and begins railing about how he was wronged. He is particularly galled since he went into politics intending to do good. It doesn't seem fair. Boethius laments that, while God orders the heavens and the earth, the affairs of men are chaotic and nonsensical, guided only by chance. Philosophy tells Boethius that he has let his emotions get the better of him and must get a grip on himself by recognizing his native land, the true place he came from, metaphorically. She says she has a remedy that will gently, at least at first, read him of his pain, and that he is wrong that chance rules the world of men. Rather, God orders all of creation. Boethius isn't able, in his current state, to see God's scheme and his place in it. Book 2. Now philosophy explains to Boethius why he is so unhappy. He feels deprived of the wealth and status he used to have. But his previous situation was the result of chance e of fortune. The wheel of fortune spins round and round, and what it gives it also takes away. Philosophy then speaks in the voice of Fortune, who makes the case more forcefully. How have I wronged you, asks Fortune. I gave you all sorts of things, many of which you enjoyed. Why should you rebuke me now? You should have known all along that some day your luck would turn. You are hardly being consistent when you enjoy good luck and lament bad. Unsurprisingly, this doesn't make Boethius feel much better. He tells Philosophy that he is not convinced. She responds by recounting all the blessings he received in his life. In fact, she says, the good events in his life outnumber the bad. His current situation is his first real setback. Boethius replies that all his good fortune merely makes his current situation feel worse by comparison. Maybe, he says, he'd have been better off being miserable from birth. Philosophy then lists some of the good things remaining in Boethius' life, such as his family situation, and reminds him that things could always be worse. Moreover, she tells him that material possessions don't survive death. In addition, most people's desires outstrip their needs. People really need very little to prosper. But more importantly, says philosophy, true happiness resides inside, in self-mastery and self-knowledge, which separate man from the other animals. Boethius says he understands that material wealth doesn't bring happiness. But that's not what he was seeking. Rather, he went into politics to improve the public good. Doesn't that sort of endeavor bring happiness? Nope, says philosophy dismissively. Rank and power are worthless. They merely address man's physical side, not his mind. Anyway, like fame, they are transitory. Fame is fleeting and future generations often forget the once famous. Worldly fame is insignificant relative to eternity. Good people don't worry about fame, they are guided by conscience. Philosophy then, surprisingly, comes to fortune's defense. Ill fortune, says philosophy, keeps people virtuous, just as consistent good fortune pushes people toward vice. Bad luck shows you who your friends are. Fair weather friends desert you when things are bad. Real friends don't. Book 3. Boethius tells philosophy that he's starting to feel better. 
philosophy says she knew he would, even though her medicine is bitter. Their discussion of what leads to unhappiness was necessary, though, for one must clear away weeds and brambles to prepare a field of cultivation. Now, she says, they can turn to the real topic at issue, happiness. All men want happiness, in fact, it is their main concern. This is man's natural inclination, in accord with the laws of the creation. The problem is not that people don't seek happiness, rather, they seek happiness through the wrong means. They think power or money or fame or material goods will bring happiness, but they won't. To be happy, men must return to their original nature, says philosophy. She then questions Boethius about the material comforts he enjoyed. Did they make him happy, or just hungry for more, like a miser who is never satisfied, even with enough gold? Philosophy now circles back to an earlier theme, that public office, while it might make you famous, won't make you happy. Certainly, virtue and public offices are not necessarily connected. Scoundrels hold lots of public offices. Worse, officials might be revered locally, but usually they aren't revered in foreign lands. Anyway, people are fickle. They love some officials one day and hate them the next. Nor does the power of high office allow peace of mind. In fact, being powerful is like having the sword of Damocles over your head, at any moment, you could be deposed. And power is always geographically limited. There's always some distant country you can't subjugate. Philosophy then attacks bodily pleasure as a source of happiness. First, even though overindulgence in sex and food feels great, afterward you invariably feel melancholy. It also provokes anxiety to worry about where and when you are going to satisfy your desires. If these activities were the secret to happiness, then animals would be the happiest of creatures, since this is basically how they spend all of their time. Finally, sexual indulgence often leads to children, which can be a source of immense grief. Sometimes they turn on you, even if they don't, you're always worried about their welfare. Euripides was right, the misfortune of the childless man is a happy one. Philosophy now summarizes and extends her previous arguments, focusing on fame and station. First, people become famous merely because the mob loves them. Yet the mob's opinions are often wrong. While being famous locally may be exciting, you are still unknown in distant regions. If local fame brings you happiness, then distant anonymity should equally bring melancholy. Nor is noble birth worth much. After all, you didn't do anything to deserve it. Bodily pleasure is ephemeral, as is health. And however much pride you may take in your physical gifts, there is always someone, or something, stronger, faster or otherwise superior. So much for the negative argument, says philosophy. Now she turns to the positive argument on what happiness is, rather than what it isn't. She changes her approach. Rather than giving Boethius answers, she uses the Socratic method, asking him a series of open-ended questions designed to make him see the right answers for himself. The two then discuss the good, agreeing that God is the source of all goodness in things. Since happiness is the highest good, God is happiness. Why? Well, there can't be two highest goods, God and happiness, so they must be the same. In short, happiness is found in the good and the good is God. All good things have unity, says philosophy, as you can see by looking at the natural world. All things want what is good, even plants, animals and natural phenomena like fire. Of course, what's good for a plant or an animal, to say nothing of fire, isn't the same as what's good for human beings. Philosophy and Boethius work through this complicated chain of reasoning, but Boethius remains perplexed. The conclusion? All things seek the highest good for themselves. In fact, they submit to their highest good. Accordingly, man should submit to God. This shouldn't be a scary thought, though, since God, as the highest good, can't be evil. Book 4. Now Boethius asks philosophy the question that has been plaguing him. Since God is good and God rules the world, why is it that the world is so unjust? After all, good people go unrewarded all the time, while bad people prosper. Boethius gives himself as an example. He did the right thing, yet here he is waiting to be executed. Well, says philosophy, bad people are not in enviable positions. They lack true power. 
Sure, they may have the trappings of power, political office, for example, but they have abandoned their true nature, what they are seeking isn't the true good. So in a way, they don't exist as men. They are nothing. Because of this, says philosophy, the world of man is just. Bad deeds make people miserable while good deeds make people happy. So, she says, don't worry so much about the wicked, they are getting what they deserve. What's more, they are no better than the animals, since they don't live according to man's genuine nature, which is to be good. Still, says Boethius, they certainly do a lot of damage. Not really, says philosophy, since their harm is always limited. This is not to say they shouldn't be punished, but that punishments are good for them, like a remedy for the sick. Boethius now raises another concern, the apparent randomness in human life. Benefits and burdens seem to be doled out by fortune haphazardly. Yet if God governs creation, how can that be? Well, says philosophy, things merely seem random. They aren't. God is, in fact, ordering things behind the scenes. You won't ever be able to understand the ordering fully, she says, but trust that this order exists even when you see what appears to be misfortune. Philosophy then counsels Boethius to accept life's ups and downs. Don't get too excited when things are good, and don't despair when things are bad. Follow the example of Odysseus, among others. Book 5. Boethius asks philosophy whether chance, or randomness, really exists, since it sounds like all events in the cosmos flow from divine providence. They do exist, says philosophy, but not in the ordinary sense. What seem to be chance events are really unintended consequences, which arise because certain results are unforeseeable. But just because something is unforeseeable doesn't mean it's random. All right, says Boethius, but if God orders all things, how can man be free to choose? Is there free will? Of course, says philosophy. In fact, there are degrees of freedom and people obsessed with worldly desires are the least free. Now Boethius brings up another problem, a variation on the free will puzzle he has just discussed. If God has perfect knowledge, says Boethius, then he knows the future, and if he knows the future, how can man have free will? Boethius considers various traditional solutions to this problem, and concludes that they don't work and free will appears to be an illusion. Ah, says philosophy, you don't understand human cognition. Once you do, you'll see how the problem is solved. For starters, the mind has four kinds of operations, sensation, imagination, reason, and understanding. Different kinds of living things use different types of cognition. For instance, creatures like barnacles and oysters use only sensation. Animals that can move use imagination. Man uses reason. God, in contrast, uses a different kind of cognition, e understanding. Man has no access to this way of thinking, just as barnacles have no access to human reason. So when God sees the future, it is through this kind of understanding, which collapses present, past and future into one. Moreover, God can foresee free choices that will occur in the future, while at the same time seeing their result. Foreknowledge and free will, therefore, do not contradict.